Welcome to Feeling Beings Who Think, a podcast project that seeks to find wisdom in conversation through the stories and personal reflections of regular people like you and me. My name is Arianne Rice, and I'm really grateful you're here. So let's get started. You and I are our stories, but not just our stories. Who we are is also based on how we choose to reflect on our stories. What is it we decide to take away? What stays with us? What are the experiences that have made us who we are? The stories that are part of our personal history, well, they are also the ways in which we learn to interpret our lives moment by moment. This is one of the many reasons why I love listening to stories. So I was delighted when Jessica Miles Hankin and Laura Wexler said yes to my invitation to be on the podcast. We met back in 2019. I had reached out to Laura because she works with individuals and communities to help them tell their stories, something you might want to learn a little bit more about after you listen to this conversation. Together, Jessica and Laura founded the Stoop Storytelling Series, which is a Baltimore-based live show and podcast that features, quote, ordinary, end quote, people sharing the extraordinary true tales of their lives with the mission to build community through the sharing of personal stories. I have had the joy and terror of being a storyteller in this series twice, but the experience I really want to talk about with them was the sacred space that I encounter when I sit in the audience at one of their storytelling events. As you will hear Laura say in this conversation, when you create an environment where authenticity instead of perfection is the winning quality, you bring out the best in people, the most human, the least judgmental. Don't you all think we need a little bit more of that in the world? Creating that, that is sacred space for me. Authenticity over perfection. Now, speaking of authenticity, this was my first conversation with two people, which is challenging. And we had some technical glitches because, hey, this is not a professionally produced podcast. So thank you in advance for preparing your ears for authenticity and not perfection. Please go to the show notes to find ways to listen to all the great stories that The Stoop shares, or better yet, if you are local to Baltimore, get tickets to an upcoming event. I hope the wisdom and insights shared in this conversation encourage some personal story exploration of your own, and I really want to thank Laura and Jessica for sharing some of their story with us. Personal storytelling, my friends, is powerful and it connects us to each other for the good. Thanks for connecting with this podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. Well, hello, Laura Wexler. Hello. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing super excited because I know in a few moments that Jessica Miles Hankin, your um, partner in storytelling, Endeavors will be joining this call. And in all honesty, I feel like I'm talking to super famous people. So I'm really excited. (laughs) No. Well, right back at (laughs) you. So, but say a little bit about what the stoop is. Oh, yes. And and what what it is you and I are even talking about, because somebody might be completely confused at this moment. Great. Yes. So the Stoop Storytelling Series is a live event and a podcast that features, um, uh, as we call it, the extraordinary true stories of, you know, quote unquote, ordinary people, everyday people's extraordinary true personal stories. Um, and we started in 2006 um, with the plan just to do a show and see what happened. And here we are, Jessica announced at our most recent show that we are starting our 17th year, which is crazy. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And so the for the podcast, we mix and match and recurate the stories that have been shared live. And then the other part of the stoop is we do is one that I have developed and sort of 
um, run, which is our training and workshop, a sort of educational division. And um, that is a huge passion of mine. So I still, you know, even I, I actually did a lot of online um, workshops and trainings during COVID. And now I'm getting back to do them in person again. And so really empowering people, giving them the support and the space. And there's like, like some very practical, ap- actionable guidelines is a huge mission of mine because I think personal storytelling is so powerful. I want as many people as possible to have to have a way to use it to express themselves or educate about their cause. It shouldn't just be something that is reserved for, you know, the few people who already know how to do it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, all of us are storytellers all the time, right? I mean, it's just, it's how we live in the world. And yet some people have said to me, like, you know, they'll hear me preach or whatever. They'll be like, oh, you you have such interesting stories. And I said, well, you do. You have just as many interesting stories as I do. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. And I think you're right that a lot of us are blind to that. You know, we think that we're not interesting people. We, we're we not famous. We're not, you know, we haven't achieved something for the record books or anything like that. And it's just not true. People are so eager and hungry to get a look in someone else's life as a way of understanding that person as a way of understanding humanity and then also themselves more fully. So it that's a great thing to, to be able to tell people is to give them permission and encouragement to take up that space, you know? Okay. A couple of things. Number one, now I have to welcome Jessica Miles Hankin into the conversation in the Zoom room. And now I get to say what I've been so excited to say, what which is this is my first three-way and that brings me great joy. <laughs> and all of you can stop thinking inappropriately. Well, this is not my first. No, I'm just kidding. Um. <laughs> no comment from me. <laughs> so Jessica, to bring you in I was just talking with Laura about all of us have incredible stories and how all ordinary people have extraordinary stories to tell. And we don't necessarily always know or value that within ourselves. So the follow-up I wanted to ask Laura is when did you discover that and how did you discover that? Well, I think I've been knowing that I just am one of those people who has always been really fascinated and curious about other people. Like when I was a kid, I was a consummate eavesdropper. I was always watching other people, studying them, listening, everything. So I've always been fascinated in other people. And that the first form for me that took was was journalism, long form literary journalism. So interviewing people, writing their stories. And I, you know, did a book based on that. And then um, I started teaching memoir writing in graduate school. So when I first learned about personal storytelling, live personal storytelling, it was familiar to me from both journalism and from teaching memoir. Okay. Well, that's probably a great way then to invite Jessica to answer that question and say hello. Hi, thank you so much for having us on. This is, this is really fun. Uh, I'm so excited. I told Laura, it's like, in my mind, I have like super famous people on my podcast and I'm really excited. Yeah. We are Baltimore famous, which means (laughs) we are not famous. (laughs) That's correct. So what is the specific question? Wanting to know what it is that allowed you or brought you or caused you to understand or see or appreciate the fact that every single human being has an incredible story and many incredible stories to tell. And how did you come upon discovering that so that you wanted to do that in the world? Yeah, I don't know if I, um, it's going to, it's going to be a weird answer. Uh, and I don't know if I ever thought like, oh, this is what I want to do in the world. I, I lucked into the stoop by way of my friendship with Laura and just by my background with um, being comfortable up on stage. Um, and it was a live event. And so it just, it made sense for us to partner. But as far as like knowing that everyone has a story inside of them, the reason why I know this and I knew this from a really young age is because I'm the child of an alcoholic who Mm. got sober when I was, my mom 
uh, went to rehab when I was 12. And as part of her, like her rehab experience and then going into a halfway house and her reintegration with like having a daughter again, um, cause my, my brother was, was 10 years older, uh, roughly was, um, that I would go to meetings and at meetings, I would sit in here. It was, it was women. And the shape of an AA meeting is kind of, is not unlike a stoop story in some ways yep. and not unlike a sermon in some way. That's like, very true. It, it's this ability for people who wouldn't normally have this audience and attention and love and care to share incredibly vulnerable truths about themselves. When I really thought about like, oh, right, that was my first nugget around all of this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. My experience of Al-Anon, my first experience of Al-Anon growing up in an alcoholic household was the first time I walked in being horrified by the vulnerability shared in the stories and turning around and leaving and saying, thank you, no, thank you. I, I, I don't need that. That's not something that's going to help me. <laughs> and then years later, learning it actually could help me. And, you know, I do think, and either one of you can answer this because the word vulnerability now has come up a couple times. It is incredibly vulnerable to stand on that stage and share a story. And at the same time, there is a vulnerability the audience shares in like holding the person mm -hmm. and letting them know no matter what they say, it's going to be good. Yeah. That's the quality that is sacred for me when I attend that event. It is not yeah. a quality I find all the time at church. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I wonder if that has to do with the fact that you're a professional in your, in your work at church, right? Yeah. It's a scripted and, liturgy and there's, and I'm telling people a little bit more. I mean, sometimes I'll incorporate a personal narrative, but you're very yeah. right. Yeah. And so you know, what happens with Stoop, I think, is is several things. One, it's that everyone in the audience knows how blurry the line is between them and the people on stage sharing stories, right? You know, I mean, quite literally, the people in the audience could be up at the next show or maybe even that show, right, if they put their name in the hat. So I think there's there's that, but I think also there's like, there's that something happening in people's brains that's can be thought of as like a mirror effect. And that is that when the storyteller comes, you know, as they are so authentic, vulnerable, and in emotionally present, it creates a mirror effect in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I really do think that is we're seeing that happen. And in fact, like, having witnessed that this at our shows early on, like really drove me into the science of storytelling. So the neuroscience of storytelling and what's happening deep in our brains and why there is that feeling when people, when a story is really engaging, like a very big crowd can start to feel small and, and is as if they're doing everything in unison breathing, you know, and there is, there is a sync that happens in people's brains, um, sync S Y N C. So it was really that experience of, of watching the audience and being part of the audience, even as we're hosts, um, at the stoop that really raised questions like, what are we seeing? Is this, is this just a woo woo thing that I'm feeling or mm. what is the basis for this? And really that is a lot of what's at the foundation of the training I do is like this evidence base research about the power of storytelling and what the elements are about storytelling that creates such a powerful um, engagement and identification. That sort of mirroring effect has a lot to do with why, you know, even when people share stories that might be shocking or really different or alien, we've never had a crowd member in, you know, in our 16 years be a jerk, like right. call out, you know, there's, it brings out the best in people, the most human, I said, the least judgmental, right? All the things that we can be in our regular lives. When you create an environment where authenticity rather than perfection is the real winning quality, I think regardless of where you are, you would get some kind of, you know, a similar kind of thing. I mean, I think there are lots of other storytelling series 
And they may not be as interested as we are in like everyday people and sort of authentic stories. They may be more interested in the performative and the more going toward the perfection. And that makes for a different, a really different kind of experience, not, not better or worse, just really different. So I would say it it's our interest in that. And we our motto is everyone has a story. What's yours? So from the beginning, we were always defining ourselves as, you know, a series that prized a diversity and, you know, variety of people and actually preference for non-professionals. Um, yeah, that's you know, what non- I was just thinking of. Well, tell me a bit, a little bit about what it's like for you, because one of the things that I think is rather courageous is when people open up a space for something to happen and they don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And yet they are still the people in charge. Being okay in that discomfort is something that we we can cultivate and learn to practice. I think it helps us in other areas of our life, but you, I can see you nodding your head. So you know what I'm talking about. So, well, I'll just say mine. And then I want to hear what Jessica says about this. Um, I, in the beginning, I definitely struggled with just really understanding again, like I had to learn that there was something much more powerful than perfection or an attempt at perfection um, going on at the stoop. I, I didn't know that coming in. I came in as a writer and as a writer, you're constantly revising. You don't want, you want everything to be perfect, right. And polished and the best you can do. And this, this broke my brain really once I realized, um, that wasn't what this was about. And it probably took me too long to, to realize that because I was so set in that mindset. But once I did, then we really changed our coaching to really emphasize, you know, helping people get to the essence of their story, you know, whatever that would be in whatever story is the, you know, whatever the story is and the storyteller is. So, so I, I completely let go of perfection, which was great. Um, but I think the thing that I still struggle with is like, this is like who I am in every aspect of my being and soul. Like every aspect of my work is about stories. And so sometimes I struggle when I feel like I have a sense of how, of like what the essence of a story is. And I, I want to see that surfaced. And the storyteller either isn't able to make that happen um, for whatever reason or doesn't want to. That for me is like continues to be a challenging situation where I I struggle. And Jessica, you know, knows that I struggle. Yeah, the with dog's that. been banished now. So Jessica's <laughs> Well, no, the dog's now in the room with me because I have <laughs> So it's, uh, it's going to continue to be, um, you know, roller coaster whenever I talk. So I apologize for that. I would say uh, that I am, I'm really the opposite. And this is, I think, why, you know, we ultimately make a good partnership. Gosh, I, I didn't realize I was going to talk this much about being a child of an alcoholic. But one of the ways that it, it really impacted me is that I am actually, and I think a lot of children of any sort of, you know, trauma, they can go either way, right? They can be super, super controlling and type A, or they can just kind of just have a lifelong philosophy of like, I don't know what's going to happen next. So I'm just going to enjoy what's happening right now. Not to say that I'm very good at being present because I, I, I'm definitely working on that, but I would say I am really good at meeting people where they are. And then, um, and just, and maybe not as good at pushing them beyond. And that's where Laura comes in. I forever am like, it's wonderful that you're on stage. It's wonderful that you're taking this risk. Thank you for going on this ride with us. And, and then, you know, knowing that the format is not that anyone's a professional storyteller, trying to um, make sure that the audience kind of has that telegraphed to them from the get-go, like these, you know, so that their expectations should be right side, that this is not going to be like the Kennedy Center um, necessarily, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's not incredibly magical and be- beautiful and authentic. And like, I, I would pay good money to see every, most of our soup shows. We've done a couple of not so great ones uh, in the earlier years. But um, I think the other thing that I have is a background in improv that really helps because the whole format is like you leap and then that will catch you, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. And I love that philosophy. It really feels 
it allows me to take fun risks and feel like I'm not a crazy person for having done so, for having been vulnerable, for having yes and, which is the you know improv term, like some crazy ideas and decisions in my in in my past and present. So this long way of saying I love it when people show up and are just the, they're themselves and they're trying to shape a story that's in seven minutes that they think should be shared with two to 500 people. (laughs) Okay. So a couple of things. I had a leadership coach, Mike Coe on this podcast, and he uses improv as his framework. I mean, the yes, and as a perspective, just for people to try on in a day, it doesn't mean you're necessarily agreeing to everything, but you're accepting the truth that has been presented to you and then responding appropriately. And the second thing that I noted is you talked about, you know, giving the audience a heads up as to what's to come. And so in essence, like as a facilitator person, you know, I lay ground rules when I'm going to engage in some sort of intentional conversation. And so you're setting up a space with a group of people where you are laying out some ground rules, right? There's a time limit. There's the audience is prepped as to what they're going to hear. This is not professional. And, and I feel like all of this is what creates that space for that vulnerability and that mutual holding to happen. Because, you know, as a church person, I long for more sacred spaces where human beings come together and are human beings. And the only places I can think of where they lay ground rules and let human beings be themselves in an unpolished way are 12-step support groups. Church is not that. We definitely have ground rules and we have a scripted liturgy. And, you know, I love church. It's all good and wonderful. But if anything, I think people feel a pressure to show up a very certain way and to mm-hmm. be particularly polished about certain things and to present. So what's, why can't we have more of these kinds of spaces? <laughs> like, what do you like? I just want to want your feedback on this idea of that's one of the reasons why this is so important for us as human beings in community. By the way, this is the stupidest church for me. I mean, stories are Amen. my religion. Amen. Stories are my religion. Yes. Um, and I always feel better about humanity after a soup show. I just mm-hmm. do. I just feel filled and like warm, regardless of what's happened. Uh, so um, why can't we have more spaces like this? I think we can. I think, you know, I think people are trying to make spaces like that. I mean, I feel like I I tried to do that with our family, you know, mm-hmm. where we share stories and, you know, everybody is invited to have feelings and have that. And I talk about, you know, I try to relate to people in that way. Like I'm terrible at small talk because I think it's the opposite of that thing. So I feel like, you know, a good dinner party can, can have this quality, right. Or gathering. And as Jessica knows, I can get really disappointed when it's not, you know, because I find it so nourishing and I find meaningless talk or talk that is not about a kind of communion. I feel like, so draining and, and kind of demoralizing. I grant that that's not like always the easiest, doesn't make me the easiest person to be around because I, I do want, I do seek that nourishment. I seek that in every, I seek that in art. So I have like very high standards for me, for what's nourishing to me. And I don't want to watch things that are not and blah, blah, blah. So I'm your basic nightmare. Um, Well, and in some ways, I don't know. I mean, I relate to a lot of what you're saying. I've tried to structure certain gatherings at my house and Brian. So Jessica, I don't know if you know, but I've gotten married since we last like really hung out, but, but sometimes he's like, Arian, you cannot orchestrate everybody to have the, he's like fired and they cannot engage in this depth of conversation. Yeah. But part of what you're explaining to me is also about, I don't know, it's a little bit of self-care as far as I'm concerned, like making a choice about what nourishment you're going to put in your head and heart. Right. Jessica, what do you want to say to that? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think it's hard to, because, you know, during, I don't know, I don't know if you know this, but I, during the day, I worked for Baltimore City Public Schools, and um, I would say that I try to keep, I've had to keep my, like, stoop life and, and the kind of the adjacent improv life very separate from my, like, professional life. You know, I don't, I don't think it, it's funny, because in some ways, it's very on. American, right? To be very authentic and real, but not so much vulnerable. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's It's not safe, right? Yeah. And in a workplace, I have to be very 
deliberate about what I say, very thoughtful uh, before mm-hmm. words come out of my mouth. So it's such a, that's a, a special, like another reason why I love improv and another reason why I'm so grateful for Stoop because it, it, it's the, it's a, a place where you don't, you can, you can take risks and, and say, think more truths in uh, a social setting than you would in, in other settings. So I, th- th- that phrase, be vulnerable, sometimes I find that challenging because what I try to explain to people, you know, in my work with facilitating around courage and vulnerability and shame resilience is we are vulnerable, <laughs> that the choice isn't to be vulnerable. It's yeah. just a state. Yeah. It's more like the choice to not put up a lot of shields, to not engage in meaningless talk. I wanted to talk a little bit about the coaching you do. You know, the first time I shared the story in front of the group that was doing that night, I could not believe the divine irony that the first comment made was somebody saying, do you know what the word vulnerability means? <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Because I wasn't. Wait, I, so, well, someone has asked you that in the coaching? The, of the, in a very good way. You know, it was like uh, one of the, because you guys were giving me feedback because it, when I'm it's the same thing, like writing that, what you were explaining, Laura, that happens to me with writing. I get stuck in some ways. That's why preaching is a gift because I've gotten okay with trusting. And I've been in this community long enough that I'm going to say what needs to be said in a way that is being real and being, and trusting that the words will come and just having that nugget of an idea. And I feel there's something akin to that with the storytelling, even though you do also have a structure, but I remember saying to Brian, when I worked with you guys before that, I said, this part of it's almost more like the the delivery was great. That was awesome. Right. But that aspect of the way you guys talked to me and got me to like, get to that nugget piece. I would, I thought that was fascinating. And I feel like that's something all of us can do, whether or not we share that story, you know, on a stage or not, it's like a journaling technique, you know, it's an incredible tool for self-reflection. So can either of you just talk a little bit about that and, and what that means when you're coaching somebody? That's my favorite part too, to be honest. I mean, I enjoy the shows, but it's not, that's not the ner- real nourishing part for me. It's working with someone to get to the heart of it. And for me, that's, I feel such an honor coaching someone, being a guide. It's so rewarding. I feel like it's rewarding just in terms of, create birthing this story, but with them or being, being um, by their side, but also seeing the clarity and kind of just the value of it for people of using storytelling as a tool to make meeting or discover something. So yeah. And like, I just, that's what I was sort of saying earlier is I feel like that part of the sacredness of it, that, that, process that communion over a story is where uh, is what I want to be doing is I want to be helping people get to their truths and then figure out how to structure an experience for the audience so that they they experience the truth that they've discovered and I think a lot of times it works really wonderful wonderfully because that's what the storytellers want to sometimes it's not a good match Mm -hmm. Um, that people are there to tell a story they want. They're not game for that intensive process. And so part of what I've I've had to do is kind of learn that, but it's a struggle because yeah, I'm just so, my brain just goes, it's just like, yeah, my brain. I mean, I, I, for better or worse, I, I have a narrative brain and I can pretty quickly see what could be done. And sometimes it's hard to, to help enact that. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm not a writer at all. Uh, so um, I don't have a brain that does that. I, do, I, I love supporting people and be, you know, and just showing them that this like little mini world that they're creating in the coaching session is, you know, going to be a, just a small glimpse of the love and care and support that they're going to get the night of at the event. I do want to ask you, Jessica, a little bit about that word sacred, because Laura, I love how you beautifully are using like, quote unquote, religious words, like the communion you just talked about. I love utilizing words that are in one category, putting them in a new category. You know, I started before you came in talking with Laura about to me, there's something so sacred about storytelling and what you all are doing. And 
I'm curious to know from you, Jessica, like what that word sacred means to you and what you think about that feeling. So I would say that, you know, I feel like the sacred is is the moment when either as an individual or um, a collective where a human does two things at the same time is one um, remembers that life is finite and in that same moment has a deep gratitude that you get to live it. That's what it is to me is that whatever like that mix of feelings, like I know this is going to go away but what a lucky beautiful thing that I have this moment this time this 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 experience I've had to really develop that you know because I was raised Catholic um so what sacred meant growing up was untouchable and un, um and and kind of a little bit like you had to keep it at distance and it was a little bit scary and like um, only certain hierarchies got to really access it and uh, interact with it um, and you as the audience member or the you know the congregation you get you get the opportunity to watch it's been interesting because I have a son as you know uh, who's really interested in Christianity and we have not raised either of our kids with any religion because my husband was his dad is Jewish and his mom is um, from Sweden. You know, they have their own just religion around being super sad. And uh, <laughs> although it is very true. Uh, and then, you know, I grew up Catholic. Um, so I didn't want to put that burden on my kids. Um, and Eric, my husband didn't share any sort of like, he didn't, he didn't understand religion. He always felt very shunned from Judaism and Christianity because he was perceived as being Jewish, but then his Jewish relatives, because it wasn't on his mom's side, didn't, you know, bring him into the fold. So um, that's a long way of saying my son has been interested in Christianity. So I have been bringing him to church and Arian, your church, um, I love so much. It's like uh, it, it, it feels sacred in all the good ways. Um, There's something when you're talking about that communion and the bringing together of people. For me, it's this idea. And I, I totally agree with you, Laura, that we can do more of what I would say using some scripture, build people up in love, which is create spaces for people to be who they are um, and be supported in that, if just for a moment, and also giving them the space to revisit a story, which mattered to them. You know, does it doesn't even matter mm -hmm. if, it, if it's a big deal. Th that's the thing I like too, Laura, is so many of the stories, like you could say they're incidental incidents, not, not everything mm -hmm. you, that's talked about is some monumental life event. They can right. be really, but it's almost as if sometimes those, <laughs> those are the kind of most glorious and also the most connecting because as I heard once in 12 step, the power of hearing my story on somebody else's lips within a totally different environment, you know, it's mind blowing in the awareness of our connectedness. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, you know, I always say in, you know, when I do the trainings, like there is no threshold of importance that you must meet before you can share a story about something. It is really, it's really a story is really only partially about what happened. It's, it's actually so much more about what it felt like and what it means. And so like, that's a thing that I talk about in my workshops is like, ideally every story answers those three questions. What happened? What did it feel like? And what does it mean? You should come to a Bible study. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's exactly um, what I think of those stories. Yeah. So what, what you see is that what connects people is, is most of the time, not the content because that can be unique, you know, the content of like, you climbed Everest, you didn't, you know, whatever, um, what, what people connect to and relate to is, is, are the emotions. And as it turns out, there are not that many emotions in the world and we know them all. So I do this fun exercise where I, I ask people to try to name an emotion that they've had that no one else has ever had. Mm -hmm in the room. Mm -hmm. And so you get people trying to, they'll say, Oh, you know, this, and everyone raises their hand. Yes. I've had that, that, you know, 
And so that's why it's so important when you want to connect with people to be emotionally present. I would say that's a very, very close um, second to vulnerability in terms of what allows people to enter the experience and connect is, is a very, very clear sense of what the person sharing the story was feeling at the time, is feeling that is where people connect, not with the content. And so if you if you sort of extrapolate from there, what you can see is that this is my opinion and this may be naive and optimistic. I believe through storytelling, we can all get a pretty long way toward understanding what it's like to be each other. But in order for that to happen, there has to be the invitation. That's what I think the stories ultimately are. They an invitation uh, into an experience that allows strangers to become familiar to each other. And it is absolutely through the emotional connection. The story is just a delivery system for that emotional connection. It's Okay, just let's yeah. pause though. Anybody out there, and that's especially in my line of work, and you could totally disagree, but that's exactly to me what a sacred story is, right? The stories that we lift up in a community. It it doesn't matter the literalness of the content. What matters is, can you say those three questions again, Laura? Yeah, what happened? So that's the plot, right? The external action. What did it feel like? So that's your internal you know, emotional plot. And then what did it mean or what does it mean? Right. Because right. if you're sharing a story about something that happened a long time ago, there probably meant something different to you at the time than it does now. And a lot of people are doing that already. You know, like if you hear a story that someone tells you and they're like, and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened in the end. And, and you're like, I don't feel connected. Well, it's because they focused on plot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you had no real deep connection to, to what was going on. And then the opposite can be true where someone tells you what they're feeling, but without the plot, you, you don't have a structure to enter. You don't, you don't actually have a narrative that you can join. And so you remain outside the emotional experience. Well, because this all requires some level of modeling and or training. And this is not a part of most of our experience. It's, but honestly, it isn't rocket science. No, like no, I, every, I totally agree. Everyone can do this with, with more or less training and support and desire. You know, people, I have done so many workshops and so many trainings. Like I'm absolutely confident that this is not out of reach for, for everyone, you know, yes. for everyone. It's a way, it's a way of looking at your life and then it becomes a way of being in your life, which I, again, I think is for better and worse. Sometimes like you can be like me just kind of so in it that it can be hard to so that you see stories all the time. Like I see sermons all the time. Because preachers do that. We're always like, that'll preach. That'll preach. Oh, that'll preach. Yeah. Oh, that'll preach. I should say that'll stoop. That'll stoop. <laughs> um, you know, it's just very much how I live in the world mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how I relate to other people. And, and, but yeah, that's what I love. I mean, I would say what I would love so much about personal storytelling is how democratic and accessible um, it is to a variety of people, especially introverts, especially shy people, all those. So your world is kind of storytelling all the time, right? And Jessica, you just expressed that, you know, you have a both and world. How does doing what you do in the storytelling realm inform how you listen to people in the work in your, in your outside? Like, I've got to believe there's skills and stuff that help you. Yeah. I think uh, it's definitely made me more patient and um, and taught me to try harder to speak less and listen more. In my day job, it's a very weird thing. I'm a, I'm an administrator I, in in the school system. It's a complicated, large school system, and I oversee close to fifty people, five zero. I'm in complicated meetings with families because my role is overseeing special ed programming for early intervention services for Baltimore cities, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. So parents are especially so vulnerable at that time. That vulnerability can manifest, you know, 
in it's, it's fear and it's anger and it's sadness and um and so the only thing that I have is is the ability to listen and try to connect and try to let them know that you know I'm human too and I understand and you know empathy is it's a, a word that I think is overused but it is it is how I I think I how I carved the career that I've carved which I'm proud of proud of the work that I do I can look at myself in the mirror every day which I don't know if a lot of people who work in a large bureaucratic system for you know over a decade can do but I, I feel very mission oriented and I know that everyone has a story as trite as that might sound you know and I see people so much more dynamically than I think I would have had I not had this experience of also getting to hear thousands of stories yeah that's mm-hmm. how it's mm-hmm. kind of seeped into my my day job Okay. So, I mean, I could keep talking to you guys like all afternoon and keep talking about the value of stories. I want to say, A, if you live in Baltimore, please go to the Stoop website and I will put links to everything. Please um, come out to a storytelling event because they're just, you will feel better about life and humanity and possibility and good things. (laughs) And then, and explore your stories and connect with you guys too about ways in which you might want to be exploring stories in your different in other people's realms. And Laura, is there anything else I should say or invitations or stuff you want to share? We also have a podcast. And I would say that one of the best ways to really learn how to tell stories is to listen to a lot of stories. And so there's lots of storytelling podcasts around and they're great to sample. And yeah, everyone can do this. So don't feel like you have to have some gift or some natural talent. It it isn't like that at all. And yeah, we just- Everyone can write an episode of The Morning Show, which my partner, Laura Wexler did, in addition to doing- um, uh, a, a film that uh, was at Sundance in some capacity that I still don't understand because all of this. <laughs> been like, okay, uh, wait, no, now Jessica's trying to give some props to Laura and I didn't <laughs> hear that entirely. And I want to add that. Wait, so you wrote an episode of the morning show? Yes. Yeah. She did, and she's, you need to toot your own horn. Yes, <laughs> you do, Laura. So I am going to be your hype man. Laura wrote an episode of the morning show. Wow. Uh, that, that's amazing. I know. It's so cool. Oh, now I want to thank know you. <laughs> it's well, it's coming up in the next season, which is out in the fall. Yeah. Awesome. Ninth episode. Yeah. But it's all like, I see it all. I feel like all the stuff I do. I mean, I also do work with, with people who are convicted of serious crimes to help them tell their stories. Like it, to me, it's all, mm-hmm. it's all of a piece. Um, and I just, I love that we get to do this and Jessica has been such an amazing partner, really just great. And um, so lucky that in that way. Well, we love each other. We're working. Yes. Well, and it sounds like you co- compliment each other. And it sounds like you're both very, aw- you're both very aware of each other's gifts that you bring and how you definitely work together. I mean, 17 years is pretty impressive. That's like a marriage. Yeah, <laughs> That's like, it's like a <laughs> I know, marriage. especially for a shotgun wedding like ours was. So yeah. <laughs> well, thank you Jessica both. was pregnant with Story, so I had to <laughs> marry her. <laughs> thank you both so very much for making time for me. Uh, it's a joy, joy, joy to talk with you, and I'm grateful. It was to be our pleasure. It was our yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Till next time. <laughs>